Brucham Aboyim, welcome to our home. Again, thank you for attending. This week on my thoughts, um, I'd like to discuss what is in a face. You know, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to look into the statement made by God Almighty in the Torah, where he states that he spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, panim al panim, which means face to face. Now, at first glance, it would seem that the Torah is telling us that Moshe was privy to a very special and close relationship with God Almighty. Well, well, of course, that is true. No other prophet was able to communicate with God as clearly as did Moshe Rabbeinu. However, I think there, there really is much more that we can glean uh, from the statement of Panim al Panim. I find it most unusual that the Hebrew word for face, Panim, is actually plural. This seems strange since a person only has one face. So why is the word presented in the plural tense? I think the word is telling us a great deal about our faces. Somehow, though we only have one face, well, it has many different facets. Happy face, sad face, sleepy face, angry face, questioning face. Well, the list goes on and on. There are also situations and expressions that connect with our face. We tell people to face the facts or to face the consequences. In the military, when we want someone to turn around, the command is about face. When we want someone to accept something that as is, we tell them, listen, just face it. If a person is aired, they may be shamefaced. When a woman puts on makeup, she is painting her face. If a person is disingenuous, he may be referred to as two-faced. When a person is embarrassed, uh, the blood rushes to their face and they become flushed, the red-faced. If a person is aired, we tell them that they must face the music. Then there is faceless, someone who is lacking character or individuality. As an aside, I find it interesting that the popular television show, Face the Nation, has aired for the last 70 years. Our faces tell us, tell, pardon me, tell others about our moods and even our deepest thoughts. You know, even before we utter a word, our face expresses a greeting, either positive or negative. We reveal our excitement, disappointment, and even fear before we even utter a word. Then there is a poker face, a face which has no emotion and reveals nothing about who you are and what you are really thinking. I find it interesting that a person's face moves independent of their body. A person has the ability to turn their face away from all evil, as it states in the portion of Yisrael, that the al tifnu el ha'alilim, do not turn towards their gods. It is a fact that four out of our five senses are located on our face, our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our mouth. Now, all of these senses are connected with spirituality. Our eyes are called the windows of our soul. They are the only part of our body that is sensitive to being touched by anything that is physical. Every human being's eyes has features that are unique only to them. Our ears are connected to our head and do not move independently. They do not lead. They follow wherever the head directs. In addition, they form a relationship with our mouth, as it states in the holiest prayer that we recite twice daily, the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In order for our prayers to be accepted by heaven, we must first articulate our words. Our ears must be able to Shema, to hear what it is that our lips are saying. Reading only with our eyes and not our mouth is not considered to be a proper prayer. Our noses serve many functions, such as breathing, smelling, and elimination. It also contributes to taste. Even though we eat with our mouths, in reality it's our nose, our sense of smell, that allows us to enjoy the taste of our food. Those individuals who have lost their sense of smell have also lost their sense of taste. On a spiritual level, we believe that spirituality enters our body through our nose. It is not an accident that our nose is shaped like an upside-down letter shin. 
They were in the Atbash, in the Kabbalistic way of exchanging the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, where we exchange the first letter, Aleph, of the Hebrew alphabet with the last letter, Tuf, and so on. So when doing so, the Gematria, the numerical value of the Yudke Vavke, God's ineffable name of mercy, which is 26, then becomes 300. The gematria, the numerical value of the letter Shin. As it states in the Torah in Genesis that when God Almighty first created Adam, first man, he breathed into his nostrils, not his mouth, the breath of life. When Adam, first man, sinned by eating with the tree of knowledge, he tainted four out of his five senses. The only sense that remained pristine was the sense of smell. Nowhere, nowhere in the Torah does it state that either Adam or Chava smelled the fruit. This may be the reason why a sacrifice that was brought up in the temple was referred to as a reach nichoach l'ashem, a sweet savor to God. Since it was the only sense in our body that was not tainted by Adam's sin, in addition, it is the only sense in our bodies which we do not have the ability to easily profane. Though we were created with two eyes, two ears, and two nostrils, God Almighty only gave us one mouth. The Rashbi, Rabbi Shurim Bar Yechoi, stated that God Almighty should have created man with two mouths, one for the mundane and the other for the spiritual. However, he quickly corrected himself and he said, you know, better that a person only has one mouth. He reasoned that if a person were, would possess two mouths, well, they would use them both for the mundane. We observed that in order to protect a person from abusing their mouth, God Almighty gave us two gates, one hard, the teeth, and the other soft, the lips. This was done in the hope of protecting us from abusing our gift of speech. Now, according to Kabbalah, we are told that God Almighty's Kisei HaKavah, his throne of glory, is made up of four faces, one face on each of its corners. They are the face of a lion, the king of wild animals, the face of an eagle, the king of birds, the face of an ox, the king of domesticated animals, and the face of man, the king of the world. In Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers, Shammai stated that one should greet every person with a cheerful countenance. Some people have a certain special aura that surrounds them. They are seen as having <clears throat> the face of an angel, angelic. The Torah states in Exodus that when Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, <clears throat> came down from the mountain for the third time carrying the second set of tablets, that it says, Kikaran or Panav, that the skin of his face shone. <clears throat> there are those special individuals whose faces reflect their pure inner godly spirituality without them even uttering a word. We read in the Torah in the portion of Shemini that when Aaron's two illustrious sons, Nadav and Avil, were killed by a godly fire, the Torah describes Aaron's reaction to the death of his two sons as vayidom, which means inanimate, that he was stone-faced. He showed absolutely no emotion. On the other hand, with Sarah remained, who Sarah, our mother, was told in the portion of Ayera, that she would bear a child in her old age, the Torah states that she laughed bekirba, which means inwardly. This was an indication that her face expressed the disbelief that she felt on the inside. When Hagar, the maidservant of Sarah, conceived, the Torah states that Sarah told Abmavinu, Va'akel be'eneha, that I am despised in her eyes. Somehow Hugger's facial expression revealed to Sarah that Hugger no longer felt the same respect for her that she had shown in the past. We also read that Moshe warns Paro about Makois Bechoros, the killing of the firstborn, the last plague that God brought upon the Egyptian people. Paro said to Moshe in the portion of Bo, leave my presence. He told him, Al Tosef Raos Panai. Don't dare see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you will die. Moshe replied, well, lo osif o rozpanecha. I will not see your face again. 
Both Moshe and Paro made reference to Paro's face, not his person, since it is the face that expresses the whole essence of a person. You know, more often than not, it is our face that speaks even before we utter a sound. We can deny what our faces express. However, it is our face that, more often than not, tells the others the truth, while it is our words that try to hide it. Our facial expressions project our deepest and most inner emotions. You know, I often tell my wife that we should talk to each other back to back, since her facial expressions express her true feelings even before her lips can reply. Her words many times will only try to deny that what her face has already revealed. When God Almighty brought the last plague on the Egyptians, the killing of the firstborn, the Jews were commanded to stay sequestered in their houses. In Exodus, God told Moshe that the Jews should place the blood of the Paschal Lamb and their circumcision, the Oz al Habatim, as a sign on their houses. The question asked by the sages is, why didn't God command them to apply the blood on their foreheads, much like those who followed the Hindu religion? The Zohar answers that the bloods of their paschal sacrifice and circumcision would only act as a protection from Makos Bechirus, the plague of the killing of the firstborn. However, when the destroyer would look at the forehead of the individual Jew, well, he may well find many other sins that they had transgressed, and those other sins would cause their death. So therefore, God instructed Moshe that the people should apply the bloods on their doorpost, doorpost, and not on their faces. There is a medrash that states that Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, attends all circumcisions. In fact, we set aside a special seat for him, which is called Kise Shel Eliyahu, the seat of Elijah. We also have a tradition that when a person attends a circumcision, that God Almighty forgives all of their sins. But why? Why would attending a circumcision cause God to forgive all of a person's transgressions? We are told that Elijah the prophet told God that in the future, the Jews would abandon the mitzvah of circumcision. Now, God then told Eliyahu, on the contrary, that they would continue to observe the ritual. The Zohar in the portion of Lethacha states that God Almighty told Elijah as a form of rebuke, I swear by your life that you will witness my people performing the mitzvah of circumcision for all of eternity and that you, you will bless them. Now the Bnei Yisachar stated that Elijah said to God, you know that my jealousy is easily aroused to uphold your honor. Thus, when I attend the circumcision and, and I will look into the face of anyone who has transgressed even one of your holy commandments, well, not only will I not be able to bless them, instead, I will curse them. God then promised Elijah that on the day of the child's circumcision, the father of the child, the moel, and all those who are in attendance will be completely forgiven for all of their sins. Thereby, Elijah was commanded by God Almighty to attend all circumcisions. While he is present, he would be required to bless all those who are in attendance. Then, in addition to healing the young child from his circumcision, he would also heal all those attendees who required a blessing for good health. You know, there's a story that is told about Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha was a great tzaddik and a student of the Magad of Mizrich. It happened that one day, a wealthy man entered the study hall of the Magid. Now, when Reb Zusha saw the man, rich man, he began to rebuke him, saying, How can a low life like you come to see the holy Magid? Well, the rich man turned around and was making his exit towards the door. It, it just so happened that at the same time Reb Zusha was berating the man, that the Magid was coming out of his study. He overheard Reb Zusha's rebuking the man, and, and he sent some of his chassidim to bring the man back. The Magad took the rich man into his study, and after a long while, the rich man left. After he was gone, the Magad called Reb Zusha into his room. He told Reb Zusha that this man had given up any hope of repenting, and he was considering conversion. He had come to talk to the Magad as a final last resort, and if that didn't work, then he would convert. The Rebbe said to the Magid, Rebbe, 
What could I do? I looked into his face and all I saw was his transgressions. Well, the Magid walked around his table and he placed his hand on Rabzusha's heart. He told him that from now on, whenever you look at another Jew, you will always see them in a positive light. We read in the portion of Ayetze that Yaakov Vino, that Yaakov Avinu was said to his wives after he had been instructed by God Almighty that it was time for him to return to his father's house. In the verse he tells his two wives, Rachel and Leah, Roa Anochi Espene Avichem, I saw your father's face, meaning that their father's demeanor towards Yaakov Avinu had changed. It was evident in his face. You know, the Talmud in Tractate of Erebin comments on the verse in Isaiah where it states that Enecho, that your eyes shall behold your teachers, meaning that by focusing on your teacher's mouth, a student will not be distracted and he will hear every word of the lecture. The Marsha, based on the Talmud, relates how Rabbi Huda Hanasi, the person who edited the Mishnah, once stated that had I been, been seen the front of his master, Rabbi Meir, when the latter was lecturing, rather than his back, he would have been even sharper than he was. You know, when we wake up in the morning, the first prayer that we recite, even before we leave our bed, is called Modeani, meaning I offer thanks. Well, the next word that we utter is Lifanecha, before you. The Hebrew word Lifanecha has within it the Hebrew word Panai, which means my face. The remaining two letters, the Lamed, the first letter, and the Chaf, the last letter of the word, together spell out the Hebrew word Lecha, which means to you. So in reality, we are expressing our gratitude to our Father in Heaven. Since in a sense, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, we too are privileged to be connected with God our Father in Heaven, Ponim El Ponim, face to face beginning with the good morning greeting between a child and their loving father, a father who is not only there when we wake up, it is he who puts us to sleep when we recite the Kriya Shema Lamita, the prayer that we recite before we retire for the night. You know, I think that we can all agree that words are, articul are articulated with our mouth, but that our deepest emotions are expressed by our face. Therefore, God's conversation with Moshe were punim el punim, face to face, depicting an open, honest, and deep relationship that was expressed between Moshe and his loving Father in heaven. We too need to emulate that connection in all of our relationships that we share with other people based on the concept of ahava, of love. We should do so in the hope that we can change the sinas chinam, the baseless hatred of the past that destroyed our temple and is now threatening to destroy the whole world. This can only be accomplished with avaskino, baseless love. As it states in Mishle in Proverbs, as in water, a face answers a face, so too the heart of a man to a man. Smile. You know, a smile doesn't cost a penny, but what it can accomplish is priceless. So as the words of the song says, let us all put on a happy face. It's time to love each other, not judge each other. If not, well, we'll all have to face the consequences. The clock is ticking. I would like to end with a prayer for the, for the victorious end to the war in Gaza. May God Almighty free all the hostages. May he heal all the sick and injured, comfort all the mourners, and protect all the brave IDF soldiers and those civilians all over the world that are in harm's way. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Mashiach Tekenu quickly now. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with everything that is good. And we should only know peace and love in the world. Mashiach coming quickly. Again, all the pain should end. Again, please make sure that you subscribe, that you push the like button, and please share with your friends. If you please stay, stay tuned, there will be a, a musical rendition right after this, which I hope you enjoy. God bless and be well. Again, thank you for listening. Shabbat Shalom.